Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson, and I'm your host for today's episode. Joining me for today's episode is Dr. Mateos Costa, assistant professor at the University of Saskatchewan and adjunct professor at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Dr. Mateos, welcome to the podcast. Please give the uh, audience an introduction about yourself. Hi, Clayton. I thank you so much for the invitation of being here today. I really appreciate it. Uh, brief intro about myself. I'm a veterinarian from Brazil, as my name may give it away for some of you. Um, that's where I got my vet med training. So I spent five years uh, in Southeast Brazil. Uh, my interesting pigs, well, let's let's point let's like, point the fingers properly here. Like I'm a city boy. I did not grow up with uh, animal or large animal contact. But during vet school, I had the opportunity um, or I was exposed to pork production. I had the opportunity to work with Dr. Simone Oliveira from the University of Minnesota, which some of you may remember <laughs> if you've been around long enough. And it was working with her and, uh, and working with the industry in Brazil that I realized that there was a lot going on uh, with swine medicine. And there, was, there were a lot of questions that remained unanswered. And that was uh, the tipping point for me. I, it, really, it really started bothering me how many questions I could ask people and here, we're not quite sure, you know, this is what we think is going on. And I think that actually your tip necrosis is the perfect example of that, right? It's been around for at least 50 years. The first description of it is 1984, if I'm correct. And that's just the first, you know, formal description. It's definitely been around before that. And it's one of those things that everybody sees, everybody knows we have it. And, you know, we're kind of accepting it for for the fact that it's there, but we, we could do better, right? And that's what, that's what the, the swine industry does. We challenge ourselves to do better very often. So I think this is a good example here that we're gonna to discuss today, it's ear tip necrosis. Excellent. Well, I certainly look forward to diving into that. And I think your background uh, description is perfect. Um, in healthcare, I learned very early on in my own veterinary training that uh, anytime you see the name syndrome in a disease complex, that's code for we don't know what it means, right? Hemorrhagic bowel syndrome and some of those sorts of things. Um, uh, and I think ear tip necrosis fits that perfectly because we don't even have the name included in syndrome yet. So that tells you we really don't know what's going on with it. Talk to us a little bit um, about uh, what's in the literature. Um, I, I, any good project starts with a lit review, right? To, to build on the foundation of knowledge. Is there, a, is there a foundation in the literature that you can start with for ear tip necrosis to guide your journey in research? Yes, there is. It's like you said, like everything we, we put a syndrome in its name or don't even have a, an actual name for it, it means we don't quite know what's going on. So ear necrosis is one of those things that we kind of have no idea, really. Uh, that's why I think we blame it as multifactorial. It's like, hmm, here are all the different things we think can contribute to it. Challenge with ear tip necrosis is no one has ever been able to replicate the disease, right? Uh, you think about some of the other infectious disease we have, so PERS, uh, influenza. Someone can go in the lab, you know, culture a agent, put it in a pig and get the disease out of it. That has not happened with ear necrosis yet. So in the past, the literature has discussed many, many different causes from stocking densities to temperature fluctuations. Uh, PCV2, uh, early in the 2000s, was blamed for it. Um, there is a few other viruses that have been associated with it, PERS, as, uh, as one good example. But really, all of those were, uh, if not anecdotal, they were observations from the field. So there is multiple other co-founding factors, right? There's many other things that could be happening at the same time. And those were, were one of the factors identified by those authors. Uh, one important piece of literature to, came, to come out lately uh, from a group in Ghent in Belgium is actually showing that mild necrosis, so mild ear necrosis, does not affect pig performance. And that's been fairly well sedimented in the literature that ear necrosis is not a production limiting disease, but it's definitely a welfare concern, as you may expect. If you ever had a piece of your body going through a necrotic process, it's, it's not... Uh, it's something painful for sure. Pigs must feel pain as they go through the disease. Uh, and also there is a very important uh, aspect of society perception, right? So what are our customers thinking when they see a photo of a pig that has lost a portion or its whole year, right? It doesn't reflect well on uh, the, 
the quality of care we're providing those animals and the, the support we're providing the producers. So it, it's one of those things that really bugged me with fear necrosis is how come we can't stop this, right? It's a, it's a slow process. It does not occur overnight. It's something that we know it's happening, something that we observe going with those pigs, but we are still unable to either prevent or treat it properly. And that, that just doesn't make sense, right? It's 2022. We, have, we can develop a vaccine for a virus within months and vaccinate the whole planet during a pandemic within months. So we should be able to do better for those animals and should be able to, to help producers as well. So that's where uh, we stand nowadays when it comes to your necrosis. Well, and even if there's not uh, performance losses in terms of average daily gain or mortality, I know that our friends on the the packing in, the retail end of the supply chain would remind us that ears are a very well-consumed part of the pig in many parts of the world. And um, in Asia, I have had many a dish served where, where ear, pig ear, is a, is a primary component of the recipe. And so it can be a very valuable part of the of the animal. And if there is necrosis, just like you said, right, there's not only pain for the animal, but probably pain somewhere in the supply chain because that part of the product is not available for sale. So I think it's really important that we look at it and try to address it, especially given how prevalent it is throughout the industry. This is not a unique problem that only one producer has. You know, producers of any size probably have pigs with ear necrosis in almost every barn that they that they have on feed right now. You're absolutely right. So there is that aspect of it as well. And when I say that mild ear necrosis has no effect on performance, we don't have enough data to talk about the, the more severe cases, right? Where the whole year may be lost. So yeah, you're right. There is so many different causes there that should be, or so many factors that should be, you know, raising a red flag. And on top of that, you know, you're probably using something to try to stop Right, so costs are going a little bit higher. The cost of production, yep. especially nowadays, that it's a it's a tight margin. Cost of production is going higher when you have affected barns, especially you know if it's a high incidence. And some herds, I have seen herds with close to 100% of the pigs going sure. through the nursery coming out with a degree of ear necrosis. So, it's it's not black and white. But I think at one point we normalized it because we don't know what to do. Right. We're we're stunned when then it's say, hey, this is what it is. I, there's not much we can do much better at this point. But um, well, luckily, science is here to try and help us. Right. <laughs> That's right. And the first step in the scientific process is always to try and nail down the root cause, for lack of a better term whether that's a, a, a pathogen root cause, a toxin related root cause, an environment root cause, you know, we have to, we have to fulfill kind of uh, the Koch's postulate, so to say, right? The, okay, with these conditions, we get this result. We have to have a challenge model so that we can look at it. I mean, where are you guys at with trying to put together that challenge model to land on or at least narrow down the potential root causes? Yeah, this is work that started, um, oh, I, I'm getting old, but it's almost eight years ago. We, we identified herds that were, it, they had a very high prevalence of severe ear necrosis. And we, well, the hypothesis was, is this an infectious disease, right? We hypothesized that ear necrosis is an infectious disease. So we wanted to rule out toxins, mycotoxins, and other potential agents that could not be controlled with uh, standard infectious disease control uh, options. So we start that by looking at herds with very high prevalence and investigating the presence of those factors, and we could not identify them. So we we believe that mycotoxins and um, and other potential toxins are not the cause of the problem here. So our next step was, well, if this is truly an infectious disease, um, and we kind of looked back in the literature and talked to some um, some of those people that we all, let's put it this way, we grew up reading in, as we grew up in swine medicine. So we talked to some people and said, the first step when we identified the agent associated with PERS or the agent associated with this other disease is get some fresh material from an animal that suffers a disease and, and, and you know, expose naive animals to that. And if this is infectious, and contagious, you should be able to replicate it at least to a degree, right? And that's exactly what we attempted. We, you know, we, I know that there was uh, actually the literature exposed that some trials were performed trying to implicate tryponemas uh, in, the, in the disease, saying those are the primary agents. So they, what they did is they used pure culture, so pure tryponemas. And tryponemas are an aerobic bacteria present in in the, in the GI tract, so the intestine of many different animals, they are in the environment. 
Uh, and those studies show that triponemas were not associated with lesions, right? So our approach was different that we said, hey, we're going to get fresh ear necrosis lesions from animals that we know are from an affected herd. We know it's been going on for a while. And we're going to give this to piglets from a different herd that has not had problems for a while. And that's what we did. Uh, it was quite surprising that we did induce a degree of necrosis. So we did not, on our first try, we did not see tissue loss completely but we did see lesions develop over time. And that was a bit of a, a win. I know most people would expect, hey, you didn't replicate it, so you failed. Well, in fact, for us, the way we saw it is, hey, we achieved the first step, which was to induce the early lesions, right? Ear necrosis, like I said, it's something that develops over time. So we actually replicated those first lesions uh, that appear in pigs. So some erythema, some uh, redness in the ear, some swelling, and obviously the formation of scab tissue, right? So that was the first step. And once we replicated that, we were lucky in 2022, we have access to some very fancy toys in science to allow us, that allow us to identify microorganisms. So what we did is called shotgun sequencing or metagenomic sequencing. So we essentially take a piece of tissue or a sample, we process that just to kind of clear up the, the material and we put it through a sequencing machine that outputs any and every type of DNA and RNA that is present. So it's not biased. We're not just looking at bacteria. We're looking at any microorganism and, and even microorganisms, right? So we get a lot of big DNA back, which is expected. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, we, we, we're looking for, like I said, potential infectious agents that could be prevalent and some to some degree associated with disease. So we had many different samples, obviously. And what we found out was that we could not find viruses in there. And that was surprising, right? Based on the literature I just told you, PCD2 has been implicated, um, PERS has been implicated. The, the rationale behind this is that those viruses are in the circulation. They get stuck in the ear. They cause uh, they essentially clog those microvessels, and that causes necrosis. We could not find those viruses in there. And I'll tell you, we looked pretty hard because, like I said, we, you work with hypothesis, and we wanted to rule out that we were missing something in our methodology, but that was not the case. So I think the first take-home message here is that we have uh, pretty compelling evidence that viruses are not associated with ear tip necrosis. So we obviously start pointing fingers to the other uh, suspects, right? So bacteria and fungi, not a lot of fungi as well. Nothing that would be of note associated with disease at all. Just, you know, regular uh, fungi that you would expect to find in a, in a barn in the skin. And that's normal. Pigs have fungi in their skin, just like we do. But we did identify many different bacterial agents that are associated with disease, right? So Staphylococcus hycus. We know that from greasy pig, like right? dermatitis and Staphylococcus aureus as well. So there's many different bacteria that could be um, the cause. We are now working at establishing a model that leads to the lesions we would expect, which is necrosis of the ear and, and loss of tissue to hopefully identify if a single bacteria is associated with disease. Because this could very well be a polymicrobial disease, right? Where you have multiple different bacteria, including triponemas, and together they build an environment that leads to ear necrosis. That would make our life harder, obviously, from a controlling standpoint, but at least we would come up with an answer on why we have struggled with this disease for so long. It's because it's a polymicrobial disease. Or it could be that it's not a polymicrobial disease and we'll be able to identify a single agent. So that right now is in the works. Very good. Well, I know um, you've got research that's ongoing. And so hopefully that's a, an excellent teaser to kind of leave it. And uh, we'll have you come back on here once your research is wrapped up. And we can talk a little bit more about those specific bacteria of interest that uh, maybe are, are showing up as opportunities for us to help control this ear tip necrosis. For sure, yeah, that's exactly our goal is can we improve control, right? So I think the take home message here for now is there is a lot of progress made in the direction of identifying the agent or the agents. Uh, viruses is not in our list anymore. We have rolled out. So bacteria is the cause. I am not advocating for antimicrobial usage whenever you have ear necrosis. We don't have the data to support that yet. So it, I guess the 
the message here is stay tuned. Hopefully we're going to have some more data uh, in the next months here that can be publicized and we'll have better tools to control the disease. Yeah, well, and that's a good uh, good caveat. I'll even add on to that for to be good microbial stewards. Um, we have experience treating disease like greasy pig, right? Like staph mm -hmm. in the skin. <clears throat> and just as a reminder to the audience that, uh, you know, most of the medications we administer orally don't distribute terribly well to the skin. Um, so even if, uh, even if you grow something out of the ear tip necrosis uh, on a plate at the lab and the sensitivity to an antibiotic looks good, remember you have to get the antibiotic to that bacteria in the pig and that's easier said than done. That's exactly that, right? And if we fear necrosis, we don't even know if the bacteria reaches this, the blood, right? This is so systemic circulation. It could be really just outside in the skin, and that's sure. enough. So, you know, treatments, systemic treatments or oral medications, we really don't know what will work. Uh, but that's definitely one of our goals is to identify how should we be treating this? Should this be an ointment or what are we doing? So stay tuned. There's definitely a lot of discussion, but... I think we're making progress and we hope that we'll be able to share this with the industry very soon. Very good. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mateos. Uh, appreciate you coming on the show and sharing your, your research with us and, and to our audience. Thank you for listening to the Swine Health Black Belt podcast. Please visit us at swinehealthblackbelt.com if you haven't checked out our website yet. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so that you won't miss out not only on Dr. Mateos's update uh, once he figures out the bacterium or bacteria of interest, um, but also all of our episodes that come out every Friday. Thank you very much for listening in. Please have a great rest of your day. Hey, everyone. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine health related research trial and would like to come on the show to talk about it with me and share it with our audience, feel free to send an email to healthblackbelt at swineit.com and we would love to take a look at your research. Mm -hmm.